Hey listeners, this is Christian Sager. I just wanted to say hello and happy holidays to all of you and let you know that we are posting a replay of our original Christmas Eve ghost story episode. This is the episode that started our tradition a couple years ago about M.R. James and his collection of stories, Ghost Stories of the Antiquary. We will have new episodes for you starting next week and have a happy new year. Welcome to Super Context, a podcast autopsy of media. How we consume it and how it informs our everyday culture. I'm Christian Sager, a writer and a designer. And I'm Charlie Bennett, a librarian and a radio raconteur. Each episode is us trying to understand the entertainment world that we all live in. Just a little bit better. Hey, it's our Christmas episode. Today's episode is about M.R. James' Ghost Stories of an Antiquary. Wouldn't it be nice if we brought back the Christmas Eve tradition of reading ghost stories? Wait, for Christmas? Yeah, James was a master of this, and we look at how he confronted stodgy academics and so-called safe places with his horrors. Ghost Stories for Christmas. Yeah, let's start it this year. You can follow along with these slightly puzzled show notes at supercontextpodcast.libsyn.com. And let us know about your Christmas traditions, especially if they've got ghosts or blood in them, at supercontextpodcast at gmail.com. Hey, Charlie. So when I was in college, my senior year... I really lucked out because I didn't really know, I don't know about you, but I didn't really know what the hell I was doing uh, when I was an undergraduate. Pretty much. Oh, I was in complete control of my faculties were and you? identity in undergrad. Yeah. You yeah. knew exactly what your goals were. I knew and... who I was and what I'd be doing for the rest of my life, for sure. <laughs> For me, it wasn't until my senior year that I really kind of had an idea of what I wanted to do. I know I had to go off and work and fail and come back um, to tech uh, to work here before I really yeah. found myself. And even then, it took me years. Well, that senior year, I was really lucky because there was a class uh, in supernatural horror in literature. And are you in the wilds of Vermont at this point? New or? Hampshire. In New Hampshire. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So you're up in the mountains. I and, went to the and, University of New Hampshire for my undergraduate and degree. There were libertarians roaming free <laughs> in the, the foothills. Right. And the guy who taught it was this really cool guy at the time. He was in his forties. His name was Robert Connors, uh, and it was a great class and really foundational to who I am today and the kind of things that I write. Uh, and, and I think that was one of the classes that really made me, you know, a couple of years later actually say this grad school thing might not be so bad. Maybe I'll do that. So did this help you work out your stuff about exorcisms and demons or no, that you... wasn't until much later. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't until, <laughs> until I was 30. But, um, uh, so he taught this class and it, it, it was a cervic, course that covered all the literature from like the medieval age until present day, um, you know, really introducing you to supernatural horror and literature. And the Victorian era, of course, was rife with this stuff. Um, and so we read uh, Turn of the Screw and we read, um, I want to say that we read some Algernon Blackwood and I'm pretty sure that we also um, read some Ambrose Bierce, stuff like that. And then he gave us M.R. James' Ghost Story of an Antiquary. And we read that one week. And, I, and I'll, I'll be honest, like, that was one of the ones that didn't really grab my attention all that much at the time. Um, but that professor died one year later. Hmm. He was a young guy. Uh, and uh, he had, I think his daughter was, like, maybe four years old or something like oh, that. Come like, on. Like she, uh, she came to our class one time. One time he got sick and his wife taught our class <laughs> and brought the four year old. Uh, and it was pretty cool. His That's wife, kind of lovely, his wife actually. knew her shit. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, anyway, that four year old is now probably 24 years old or, or, or maybe older. Yeah. Um, but, uh, all this to say it really haunted me. This guy died a year later in a freak motorcycle accident. He was just riding his motorcycle around the university town that 
we were in mm-hmm. and uh, had a crash and, and died. Were Le- you gone? Left behind. Were yeah, you gone from I had graduated. Yeah. yeah, and I was in Boston by then. How'd you hear about it? Uh, a, a guy who was in the class with me that was a friend of mine uh, said, hey, did you hear, you know, uh, Professor Connors uh, passed away? Yeah. yeah. Um, but all that to say is um, that was my first introduction to M.R. James. And then it wasn't until last year that I really came back to this stuff because even though I'm a fan of horror and I've, and I've, and as you hinted with the exorcism stuff, you know, I've been writing about it. I've been immersed in it for years now. Um, last year was when I really decided, okay, I'm going to dive back into the literary field of this stuff. And, uh, we hinted at this when we had our layered Baron episode yeah, yeah. and I got into that stuff, but I also wanted to go way back and I really wanted to read weird fiction from, you know, o- over a century ago. Where do you place your Stephen King sort of admiration, fascination and, you know, foundational reading? Where does that land in how you think of horror? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Because as you, you say, like he's really foundational for me, not just in the sense of, of horror, but in, in writing as well. Yeah. And, uh, and, and reading. He could be a ghost story writer or a supernatural horror writer or even a cosmic horror writer if you framed him that way. Yeah. But I know that you didn't abandon Stephen King when you weren't really deep in horror. That's you always, true. You always talk about this kind of a way and back thing that you had with horror and horror fiction and maybe even yeah. sort of creepy crawliness in in how you I did have a handle a life in a way you know part I mean? from Stephen King. Oh, and did you? Robert Connors was my way back in. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um so so you know, we've talked about this before and I've mentioned it on uh, other shows before. Uh, I started reading Stephen King when I was five years old. That's right. I okay. saw The okay. Shining yeah, when I was five yeah. years old too. Um, my mother had left a copy of Pet Cemetery laying around the house, and oh, I, Jesus and I just read that. I read a copy of Pet Cemetery. A copy. I bought a copy of Pet Cemetery from a hospital gift shop when one of my older relatives was in the hospital for a long time. So you were like waiting in the waiting room and reading through yeah, that. Yeah, I think it was 11 or 12, you know. I don't think I was I don't think I was pubescent, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I, I pre pre-adolescent is what I was reading that and the kid dies and oh, yeah. spoiler alert for Pet Cemetery, <laughs> the kid dies and then he comes back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good old Gage. Gage. Fuck. Yeah, you know, so that stuff, you know, every time I tell that to people, they go, oh, that's, and and you and I joke a lot about this, too. Like, we were just joking off air. Like I said, you know, your daughter's four now, one more year before I get to start reading her horror stories. Yeah, I was like, well, she's going to have to wait a few years before she gets in the horror. You're like, no, I started that early, and look at me, I'm fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a funny joke, but also, I think you and I both have some psychological, either damage or complications from getting too deep too early into a lot of sort of horror or adult or confrontational stuff. I think that's partially true, but then I also think that for me personally, uh, it saved me in the same way that like, you know, I know this is really cliche to say, but like punk rock saved me too. Um, because I grew up in a like pretty conflicted environment and um, Stephen King through his work provided me a role model of how the world was supposed to work a framework for a working class not perfect but still loving kind of family yeah even if that was that what i he wasn't was destroying in his book exactly yeah. and i wasn't getting that at home and so even though you know things ultimately ended in doom for his characters through them i really did get a sense of in and, and you know d- you out there listening may say like well wow stephen king is the last person you want to learn how to be an adult from but Th- this not, is true not, as well except he wrote about what people are like he he wrote uh odes and elegies yeah to the working class yeah yeah absolutely and so um does that answer your question about stephen king i guess like in the sense of the framework but when i went to college and i started off as an english major I was like, 
I'm going to be Stephen King. I'm going to write right, horror right. stories. And uh, the very first professor I had was your typical great white male literary guy. He had a couple fin. novels under his belt. And uh, I wrote some terrible Stephen King <laughs> wannabe short stories. Did you do a lot of italics and parentheses to show? Like... <laughs> <laughs> I think I might have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that guy gave me, I think, a C or something. And that was around the time where I was like, maybe I shouldn't do this whole English thing. Maybe I shouldn't try to be a writer. Um, and so I switched my degree to communications. And I had I, I had to enough credit courses in English that I could do a minor. Mm. And so to finish out that minor is when I took Robert Connor's class my last year at school. And it reawakened that in me because he taught Stephen King's The Mist in that oh, class. My, right. And he was like, you know, we've only got so much time here. Everybody here is pretty familiar with King, but let's tackle at least one work. And so The Mist was the one that we did in there. And all that stuff, you know, got it back into me where I was like, I think it wasn't maybe two years after that that I started writing fiction again. Uh, it was still pretty terrible. It took me another 10 years to get it, to a point it, where I was everyone's okay. Everyone's fiction has to start terrible. Yeah. It's yeah. just like the earlier you start writing it, the quicker you get done with well not quicker but the yeah. sooner in your life you're done with the terrible stuff actually the terrible stuff was probably when you and i first met oh yeah that we was, wrote some bad shit together. yeah we did um all that to say is that yeah mr james uh was part of that reawakening but then also is part of my new reawakening with horror literature because what i'm really enjoying doing is reading stuff like Laird Barron, for instance, and then saying, all right, that's a contemporary horror writer. Let's jump back 100 years and see the um, genealogy here. And I'm really loving it. Um, <laughs> and M.R. James, when I when I first got back into M.R. James and I cracked this open and I read, what? how do you pronounce it? Canon Alberic Scrapbook, the first story in here. I don't know why you're asking me how to pronounce it. Uh, you're a learned gentleman learned <laughs> <laughs> uh i was like wow that is a scary story and it is 112 years old okay we need to we need to orient people here yeah. in what we're talking about so who is mr james and and <laughs> why are we once again talking about somebody who's around hp lovecraft but isn't hp lovecraft well <laughs> That's not fair to him. He was, I think he was, he was dead an before he was an H.P. Influencer. Lovecraft. Yeah. Uh, okay. M.R. James, also Montague Rhodes James. You know, there's a reason all those English guys, all those, all those Go. foppy deans <laughs> <laughs> use their initials. <laughs> he is described, this is the encyclopedia entry on him. He's an English scholar, educator, and writer. He attended Eton and King's College. Isn't that Eton? Is it Eton? I'll take it. If any of our British listeners would like to uh, castigate us for the, what, how we pronounce certain things, yeah, please don't do. bother. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> See, we have we have two different approaches, Charlie and I. Uh, James, here's the thing: James was basically an academic. Uh, basically, he, he was a career academic. Yeah. But he's known for being a ghost story writer. It's so interesting. I mean, when we think about legacy versus vocation, when we yeah. think about like what what concerns you from the top of your day to the end of your day, yeah, versus what actually survives of you. Right. It is fascinating. I, I, I wonder if you went back in time and were able to tell him, like, and nobody's really going to remember what you did at a, a King's College or whatever. But boy, that story about the ash tree. You know, not to jump ahead too far in, in, in talking about M.R. James, but he probably knew that because of what he studied. He was aware, as an antiquarian, yeah. he was aware of how little of people survives well and his focus of study was the apocalypse <laughs> the great uncovering he was yeah he was uh, mostly interested in the apocalypse and revelations he translated the new testament apocrypha and was a key contributor to the encyclopedia biblica um the encyclopedia encyclopedia of the bible yeah uh and basically that's you know a reference work that addressed all the stuff that's in the bible uh he yeah he was an expert in all things about the end of the world 
uh, <laughs> which is pretty fascinating. Including the end of your mental world. Yeah. Um, and on the side, wrote ghost stories and didn't write them particularly fast. I think he only wrote like maybe 30 in his entire lifetime, but they have lasted for a century and more. And he wrote these ghost stories mostly for single yearly readings, right? Yeah, the idea was that these were stories that he was going to read at Christmas Eve to, I don't know, students or friends. He didn't have a lot of family, is the impression I got. Uh, He invited them over. And they would, you know, gather around and he would read them one of his his new ghost stories. <laughs> the promise of a scary tale along with the usual holiday refreshments. So he would say, come on over, boys. We're going to have some drinks. A little bit of eggnog. And I'm going to read you something that I wrote to see if I can scare you. Yeah, yeah. For Christmas. And And so this sounds weird to us now, but a big part of this episode, I would say the thesis of this episode is less, hey, here's M.R. James, but it's more... Why would you read ghost stories on Christmas Eve and why yeah. and why don't we do it anymore? And it turns out <laughs> that it wasn't it wasn't like M.R. James started this. Yeah, he wasn't a crazy person who decided to create this new tradition. No, this was this was a, a, a long standing tradition and it had been particularly um boosted by Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Now I have to confess something. Okay. So we, we've been talking about this ghost stories for Christmas for a while. Yeah. And, and this is our Christmas Eve Eve show. Yeah. Right? If, so this will publish two days before Christmas. Hopefully you will get a chance to listen to it on Christmas Eve. You dear listener. And maybe you'll even go find an M.R. James story to read around the fire. They're totally public domain, too. They are I everywhere. We can both say, Chris and I can both say, we heartily recommend these ghost stories yeah one just as a thing to read if you're interested but also if you are a horror fan or a ghost story fan or a lovecraft fan of any kind you know uh these these are stories that you can dig into and find some history this is some more robert chambers kind of stuff they yes and uh are you improving improving right now (laughs) uh yes and uh the thing that's really fascinating about mr james too is that they don't read as horror stories. They read as glimpses into Victorian life. Yeah. Um, and and for that, I love them, too. There's a very comforting quality to them. And we'll get to why They're in a minute. They're very detailed. They're rich in detail. Yeah. And they are, they are so stripped down in their central idea, in their sort of horror idea, their mm-hmm. ghost idea, that there's a lot of leeway for setting the scene and making people... F- I guess, at the time, he was reading them, so he had to get everyone to sure. sort of picture them very well. Had to, you know, He had to ex- have details so people could kind of get settled and then mm. slowly creep up on them with the scare. Yeah, one of the papers that I read for this today said that apparently when he would read them, he would speed up the closer he got to the end. <laughs> he would read slowly at first, right. and then he would quicken his pace the closer he got to the end of the story. There's a thing... um, For effect. Let me read this thing you found. Um, uh, uh, Okay, James would invite a select group... I started this already. A select group of friends to his home for the occasion, that being a a Christmas party, with the promise of a scary tale along with the usual holiday refreshments. Yet the author would still be laboring over his text even while guests were arriving. Until I guess if you, uh, you if you were an academic and... In late seventeenth century England, you could just leave the door open. People just kind of wandered. Yeah, in. yeah. Uh, until finally, as one participant remembers, quote, Monty. <laughs> yeah, he was known as Monty. Monty, nice. Monty emerged from the bedroom, manuscript in hand, at last, and blew out all the candles but one, by which he seated himself. He then began to read with more confidence than anyone else could have mustered his well-nigh illegible script in the dim light. How awesome does He's that sound? He's such a performer, too. Did, I mean, this is a guy who was on stage, right? This is a guy Yeah, who, he was an actor as well. Yeah. If you were a prominent academic at this time, late 1800s, early 1900s, you went places and talked. Yeah. That's what you did. You, yeah. you didn't get on the radio. You didn't get on television. You might have published in journals, but really what you did was you lectured. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. He's a fascinating guy. Um, born in Southeast England in 1862. Uh, he 
you know, won scholarships to the schools that he went to. He was eventually a, a junior dean, then a tutor, then he finally became the provost of King's College. So let's define what a provost is for people out there, because honestly, until I so worked, worked in, in academia, yeah, I didn't know what it was. What, so you guys have a provost here, right? Yeah, I, I have a non-technical definition of that school. Okay. The provost is the guy who makes casual declarations about how education should happen at a university and thus sets initiatives into motion. Yeah. The way I always thought about it was there's there's usually there's typically a president and a provost. Yeah. And I always But that's a new thing. There yeah. used to just be a provost who ran the place. I think of the president as being like the president of the United States of America. And the provost is like their hype man, and they, <laughs> and they're they're like Joe Biden. They're, the, oh, they're vice president, sort of, but they like that's kind of beautiful. They go around and 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 really, I mean, they're the ones who are really kind of running things yeah. academically. Not to get too deep into it, but uh, here at Tech, uh, uh-huh. at Georgia Tech, where I work, um, there are like six people. They're all men at this this moment in time right one can hope that they won't always be 2016 boom the, but six men three of whom are named steve are all in a room together usually i think probably once or twice a quarter and they say things like hey bud uh, i'm thinking that we should have some more green space on campus yeah and bud says sounds good and that becomes an for 15 years the greening of the campus yeah or they say hey Raphael, who's the provost Raphael." What are we doing with uh, what are we doing with this whole MOOC thing? He says, "Well, I think that we should." <laughs> Why are you what, laughing? Because our audience doesn't know what a MOOC is. What are we doing with these massive online open courses? And Raphael would say, "Well, we should probably experiment with uh, delivering some of the more technical degrees, some of the more already online degrees yeah. with MOOCs. They're idea men." And then. Ten fucking years of MOOC this and MOOC that and yeah. figuring out how to you know deliver a, a computer science master's online and all that. They just casually say stuff and make large-scale sort of directorial decisions. And by that point, that provost is probably gone. They're probably, I mean, it, sometimes they're there for life. Sometimes they're there for a year or two. Yeah. Depends on the institution. Now, I'll just tell you a brief story. Uh-oh. The last institution I worked at, the provost was legendary for doing a similar thing to Mr. James. Really? Not a Christmas thing, but she would have dinner parties, and she was known for playing the harpsichord. <laughs> And so she would uh, invite all of the upper echelon, all the deans and vice presidents of the university. Did she eat people also? I I always thought so, but I never could find evidence. And she would sit. They, she would make them all sit there and listen to her yeah. play the harpsichord. And what else? What are they going to do? Say no. <laughs> uh, so yeah, <laughs> let me finish this. Bringing it back to Mr. James. Yeah. Tease uh, tease the rest of the show, and then we'll go to a break. Okay. So there's. Uh, M.R. James was a provost of a couple different universities, right? Yeah. And that means that he was a person who could make long-term big decisions. Uh, the buck stopped with him, essentially, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? And also, that probably meant that he was able to live a bit in a bubble. You know, if, Oh, very if, much, If yeah. you are the person who's in charge of a school of some kind, you get a lot of um, validation and insulation, right? You know, a lot of things happen at schools that would, for other people, happen outside of their job. This is where people live. It's a little town. Yeah, yeah. And if you're the provost of an an English university that's out in the woods or something, up on the top of a hill, right? What what was the Harry Potter school? Hogwarts. Hogwarts. If you're at Hogwarts, right? Where it's your world, you can kind of define your own way of living. Right. Your own way of being. And people aren't going to mess with it too much. So there's, before we head into some, you know, real close look at these stories and how he produced them and what the themes of them were, I do want to mention two quotes that people said about James. The first was a friend of his named A.C. Benson, and he said that James Old old A.C.? Do you mean Artie? (laughs) His name was probably like Archibald. Archie. Yeah. Yeah. He said, James had the mind of a nice child. 
He hates and fears all problems and all speculation. That's way strange. If if a guy could run universities and that was also I I'm interested in what that actually means. And then another person who know, knew him, Lighten Strachey. Man, these are British names. Uh, <laughs> he said, it's odd that the provost of Eton should still be aged 16, a life without a jolt. Uh, and I, I think that so both of these are speaking to that he had childlike qualities, right? He had whimsical interests and they saw these horror stories as being part of that. And he was not a nasty person. Right. Exactly. At the same time, he seemed to be rather pleasant to be around. Um, and and people think that it's interesting, you know, that he was now he's now honored beyond all of this stuff that mattered when he was alive. No one ever talks about what a great provost he was. No. They talk about how the guy wrote ghost stories. Exactly. So let's take a quick break and when we get back, let's talk about how he made them. Today's episode of Super Context is brought to you by Future Oak Records, a boutique record label specializing in limited releases, lathe cuts, and hand-printed ephemera. That's right. They have a catalog that is full of beautiful, rare releases created with intimate collaboration between the label and the artists. You can find LPs, EPs, 7 inches, and even a cassette release from bands and artists like June Star, Arlo Aldo, Norman Oak, and plenty more. Hey, I listened to that Norman Oak record today. Oh yeah, what'd you think? Yeah, I liked it a lot. Um, it, it's, it's the, you know, it's funny because this is the episode that we're doing. Uh, I had MR James on the brain. Uh, it's haunting. Oh, nice. It's this very haunting record in the way that it's recorded, and it's just, I don't know how else to describe That's it. That's something that goes through all the Future Oak releases that I've heard, except for the most recent two, which are just like really fun pop, like, oh, yeah. like rock. But all of them have a kind of haunting, almost ethereal streak to them. Yeah, exactly. And I'm looking at the artwork right now, and it's got this kind of little red riding hood vibe of this little girl in a red dress standing next to a wolf with its tongue hanging out of its mouth looks like the whole thing was screen printed onto cardboard man norman oak the music is beautiful and so is the artwork that contains it visit futureoakrecords.com to find out more about the label its releases and get yourself a post christmas treat and we're back so like merry christmas ah Happy Hanukkah. Uh, happy Kwanzaa. Are we missing one? I'm sure. I feel like this is offensive. Is it? I don't know. Do you happy, want to start over? Happy holidays. <laughs> happy solstice. <laughs> Hope your sacrifice goes well. <laughs> no, let's keep it. So, like uh, James, almost all of his protagonists... Monty. Like Monty... Uh, almost all of his protagonists were obsessive bibliophiles and bachelors. <laughs> they were that's, all that's academic kind of, protagonists. Yeah, they were academic protagonists. I call them obsessive bibliophiles. I, I feel like the stories are written in such a way as to... Uh, they don't make direct fun of the people for being interested in the the texts or or the materials, right? It's right. it's maybe they're obsessive, but they're obsessive definitely in a acceptable and in fact sort of professional way. And what should be noted here about the professional quality of these characters is this wasn't unusual. Yes, M.R. James was writing what he knew, but a lot of the horror writers around that turn of the century period, especially the British ones, they were pretty much all writing about learned gentlemen doing scholarly work and stumbling across the unknown. Okay, do you have a theory about that? I mean, is, I, this, is I that don't because in, these are the people who had the time to go off and 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 find stuff that was cursed. Uh, you know, or is mm. this that you had to have a luxury, you had to have leisure time yeah. to be able to mess with dark forces. Maybe that's it. Yeah, I mean, so uh, off the top of my head, uh, Algernon Blackwood. Some of his stories were like this. Uh, Ambrose Bierce as well. Arthur Macon. Uh, I hear that name all the time. Who is that? Oh, he's a great horror writer. When people talk about cosmic horror and they talk about uh, weird horror and they associate it with Lovecraft first, it drives me nuts because I really <laughs> think Macon's the guy to go back to. Go read. Do yourself a favor and go read The Great God Pan. It is one of the most fucked up stories 
but it is definitely about two uh, erudite uh, aristocrats who just have some time on their hands and are trying to solve a mystery. Uh, the aristocrats. Yeah. <laughs> hey, do you ever want to um, build an effigy of H.P. Lovecraft and while Burning Man is going on uh, out there in the desert that we just burn a Lovecraft here? No. I mean, look, we've talked about this so many times on this show before. Yeah. We've talked about it during the I feel Anomicon. like we have to dispel it. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. We're never going to do a Lovecraft episode. No, but I think that Lovecraft has value, and and the, his work is valuable in the history of the genre and just in pop culture in general. But fandom and his image is something that you would like to clear out. Yeah, and I would like there to be more acknowledgement of his, uh, how do I put this, bastard qualities. It could be the name of our book. Super context, colon, burning Lovecraft. (laughs) (laughs) If anybody is wondering what we're talking about here with Lovecraft and you really want to do a deep dive, I recommend a book. I don't know how to pronounce this guy's name. He's French. Michel Holebeck. Have you read any of his books before? I haven't. I don't know. I who think you're that's about. how you pronounce it. Um, he's kind of a nihilistic writer, and he wrote a really good nonfiction book about Lovecraft. It's called H.P. Lovecraft Against the World Against Life. And it's partially a biography <laughs> Is it of Lovecraft. In like some kind of mask or something? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but it, it really goes a, a long way towards explaining how Lovecraft sort of fits in with things despite his awful personality. Yeah. Also, if you're coming in uh, to super context with this episode and you're wondering what we're talking about when it comes to our relationship to Lovecraft, you can find uh, in Neonomicon and in um, the Laird, Laird Baron Baron episode. Swift Chase yeah. and uh, maybe even a little bit in the Warren Ellis um, normal episode. That's true, yeah. You can find us talking about Lovecraft and, and what Lovecraft means to us and to the media that we consume. We certainly circle around him a lot, yeah. But I don't know that either of us want to tackle him as a text in particular. I'd love to tackle him. <laughs> See what happens to his knees. So let's get back to M.R. James and his academic protagonist, which is another thing that Lovecraft took from him. Yeah. Um, so he's got these characters that are all basically the same. They're basically him yeah. in these stories. Antiquarians. They're yeah. interested in ancient Hen- texts and, and old texts. Hence the title. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's just interesting to look at, like, so, so people have written many things about M.R. James over the years. This is what happens. There's a hundred years of criticism. Yeah, when we tackle something that's over a hundred years old, there's there's too much to read. But from what we looked at today, this is definitely one of the major themes that they look at, right? And um, the thing that's fascinating is that these characters, the overall theme with them is that uh, they have, you know, this philosophy of going out and finding things and discovering and uh, they're looking at uh, photos very carefully or they're trying to find a rare book. They want to be surprised by details that no one else has ever seen. Yeah. And the theme really is, well, guess what? Ignorance is bliss. <laughs> Do you think that really? Um, I mean, that's certainly what people have kind of put together. What I took from the story yeah. is that uh, the the thing that we are examining as academics, if, hey, if this coming through the microphones, everybody, those are just the black helicopters. Well, yes, they're, they're coming the, to take us. The re- recording studio. Uh, they search for books. They search for uh, mesotints. They, you know, they they find these objects and these texts. And when they find them, and they are compelling, what comes with them? Yeah, is horrifying. Yeah, and I feel like okay, so you could say ignorance is bliss, and that if you hadn't looked for him and hadn't found him, you wouldn't have been haunted. But I feel like maybe really the thing is that knowledge is power, and power is scary. You know what I mean? Yeah, that is true. And I also think because a lot of them survive, almost all of oh, them yeah. survive their encounters. Even the 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 story that he talks about a person who is a learned man who dies. He's the antagonist, and a young boy is our protagonist. Right. I, yeah, that's the thing that I think is fascinating, and it's it's part of his formula, right? Which is like, there's no sequel. There's no, right. there's no uh, there's, Ken and Alberic scrapbook, two. Yeah, and someone has changed, but 
it's handled. Yeah. The situation is over. And so it would be interesting. Like the the horror is the discovery, but we don't see the aftermath in any of his stories. You know what I mean? It's not like, and then after he discovered that yeah, this picture was there, alive. There's a lot of tidying up at the end of his stories. Yeah. And, yeah. you know. The other thing about like ignorance is bliss versus uh, knowledge, knowledge is power. Knowledge is power, and power is dangerous. Is, is dangerous. Um, the people who are searching for things and encounter these ghosts, they are not particularly flawed. Right. They are not particularly out of the ordinary. Right. They're just doing their thing. It's like, yeah. and it, <laughs> you know, the thing I hate about ghost stories because they're so effective is that really good ghost stories make it so that you can't do anything to avoid the scare or the danger. Because like, you know, even in slasher flicks, just don't have sex and you'll be fine. Right. Yeah. Or don't go down that dark hole and you'll be fine. Don't don't go to South America and and go, you know, spelunking in ancient tombs and you'll be fine. Whereas the ghost stories, certainly M.R. James's stories, if you do your regular thing. And oh, really? You have a, you have a beautiful illuminated manuscript. I would love to read that. Oh, it's got a fucking ghost in it. <laughs> right? Yeah, right. it's terrible. Well, and that's the thing, right? Is that like he was writing before that period of time in horror, but whether it be prose or or, or cinema, right, or television, where we had this idea that f- for the person to be punished by horror, they had to have some kind of character flaw that yeah. made us hate them, or to right? have gone on. An, on, out on a limb, they had to have yeah. have tested the limits of of safety or anything. These were just these poor bastards. Although, yes. although yes. there is a case to be made that M. R. James was uh, poking fun at the his own career. He was making fun of academics well, in general to, right? as I mean, being a little too snooty because he's reading it to his friends like hey everybody yeah. have a drink Ooh, right and <laughs> and yeah and that there's a little bit of a of, of a jokey quality to how uh obnoxiously erudite some of these characters are right uh and i think he was maybe like taking the piss out of his colleagues but also maybe making fun of himself a little bit well yeah yeah i mean he the stories are very generous and humane you know yeah it's true um there was another article that i read that i thought and and these will all be on our landing page at at libsyn uh l-i-b-s-y-n they say in this article that uh it's an interesting idea the the academic figure as being our adventure hero right rather than somebody like um Alan Quartermain from King Solomon's Mines, who was really like this this badass hunter guy, right? Ernest Hemingway. And then the person says, we wouldn't do that nowadays because remember the dentist who shot that lion last year? Hollywood isn't going to make him into a movie hero. <laughs> so wait, well, the comparison there is like, so a dentist is a trained... Someone who's well, been to school and trained, and and if not a life of the mind, certainly you know a professional with skills. I think it's more along the lines that he's a very wealthy man who can afford to fly to Africa, ah, the hire a guide Dang. to uh, break into a national sanctuary and murder a lion. Right. Um, that's not the kind of guy we want to be our hero, right? Well, see, at the time that M.R. James was writing these stories, certainly privilege and wealth was part of how you could be a Don, but also yeah. they weren't they weren't living in, you know, uh, enormous mansions. They they didn't have um, a beautiful cabin, you know, fifty miles out of the city, and they just came in to lecture on Tuesdays and Thursdays, sure. right? Yeah, I mean, they were there with the folk. Have, have you ever been to UVA? Uh, University of Virginia? Yes, the University of Virginia. I have not, no. So the original University of Virginia was the lawn with the uh, the living quarters and the library, you know, and, and sort of the, the main lecture area. Mm-hmm. It's very small. And the, fo- the professors and the students were living in the same places. Right, you right. Know, they were yeah. all together. Mm-hmm. And I think that happened for a long time. Certainly at, at this time, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, yeah. there wasn't this division. And so... There was still a certain, um, I don't know how to say it without sounding like an idiot. So the 
the privileged deans, dons, provosts mm-hmm. of these universities, they may have been mentally privileged. They were learned and erudite and they could be wacky, right? Yeah. But they weren't like walking around with gold shoes. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. And so they... They, they we, weren't the height of aristocracy. Yeah, we weren't looking at... We weren't looking at um, these... Uh, you know, bibliophiles who were also like, uh, I'm going to fly my private jet to Morocco and find this. Right. They were, they found stuff in used bookshops or, or in, in a broken down abbey that they were exploring. Well, you know? so this is a good opportunity for us then to say, so uh, many of the articles about M.R. James basically trace from him forward into our pop culture, this idea of the academic hero, right? And I was trying to think about it. I was like, what are our modern examples of this? Of course, Indiana Jones comes to mind. It belongs in a museum. There's that. And then I know, uh, and you're probably familiar with this solely because of your career. There's that Noah Wiley TV (laughs) movie slash TV show, The Librarian. John Rogers is a a classic pulp writer, you know, trapped in a TV showrunner. Yeah. Yeah. So like Leverage and The Librarian. Yeah. He he did those and those are his... He's also a Warren Ellis fan, speaking of our Is that right? last couple episodes. Yeah. Doesn't show. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've only seen a little bit of that I stuff. I talked to the guy for uh, Lost in the Stacks. The oh, did you? Research Library Rock and Roll Radio Show. Yeah. He's on top of things. He's definitely okay. there. You know, his, his shows are pulpy on yeah. TV, and that makes them kind of silly. But he knows it, and that's on purpose. Okay. Yeah. Well, what else? I'm I'm trying to think of other examples, like Jurassic Park. I think of like Sam Neill. Uh, I don't know about that. that. I mean, archaeologists, <laughs> Indiana Jones, like people who are out in the field already and doing yeah. it. Like that's a different thing. It's the the folks who, it's it's Doctor Who. That's an interesting idea. You yeah. Know? Like like a learned person who is going to apply their mental abilities to a problem Mm -hmm. but also have the capacity to handle in doctor who's case time travel and an alien and all that but like um oh uh (laughs) nick cage in um national treasure oh jesus right well you know the the other one that i came up with was the don't you fucking say it the da vinci code (sighs) as we are on is it out yet that what is it a prequel sequel What's it? You you know about this stuff, right? I'm, go, I'm gonna leave the studio, and you Inferno? have to do this by yourself. Inferno is that what it's called? I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna count to three. People go to see that shit, One. man. And by the time I get to three, you're gonna be done with this part. So Mr. James, okay. had a recipe <laughs> when he made these stories, and basically this is it. You've got your scholar; they're hunting for some rare item that's gonna help them win fame in their academic career. Or maybe tenure. Ooh, tenure. Tenure. The blissed tenure. Almost without fail, some ghost. And this is this is the thing that's uh, uh, misleading. They're not always ghosts in this. They're they're called ghost stories of an antiquary, but they're <laughs> sometimes they're demons. Sometimes they're weird giant spiders. Like it's not always a ghost. Where where are the spiders? Uh, I don't want to spoil that. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> there's spo- there's spiders in one of the stories. All right. Um, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Ghosts, ghouls, demons, spiders, whatever. They arrive on the scene after the midway point of each tale. And then the terrified scholar beats a hasty retreat back to their ivory ivory tower. Right? And, and handles business, too. That's the other yeah. part of it, right? Yeah. I mean, right. The, the mezzotint. Uh, <laughs> the, it... The, that photo, you know, they find they find out that there's this photo that's alive with haunted apparitions within it, showing some horrible event that occurred in the past. Yeah. But then it never again does, <sighs> displays it's, it, its that's evil. That's a spooky fucking story. It is, yeah. Um, here's the thing, but it goes up in a museum. Yeah, it belongs in a museum. Exactly. So here's the thing about you just said they're not always ghosts. Sometimes they're ghouls and demons and all that. Yeah. I, I came up with a uh, the the Bennett Unified Theory of Ghost. Huh? While reading this, okay, yeah. hit us, and and by that, what I mean is, like, I never really thought too much about ghosts. Like, I, you got Casper and Patrick Swayze, and then you know, and right. then bed sheets with mm-hmm. holes cut in them. You know, I got a rock, and uh, although I shouldn't make Oct- I shouldn't make Halloween jokes. That was Charlie Brown's Halloween. I should be making Christmas. The Shining is a ghost story. It is a ghost story. 
it's a haunted place story. Right? Yeah. Okay, but yeah. anyway, uh, so haunted houses, haunted places, ghosts, hauntings in general, right, is when something that should not be there is there. Okay. And that's the back to that sort of house should be safe, you know, yes. safety, and then it's not. Like when I'm walking around in the dark, which I am not a fan of, mm-hmm. right, sometimes I stub my toe. And then it's just like, oh, you got to be fucking kidding me. I'm going to be, why is the human body wired like this so that I'm in this much pain for this long just because of that thing? That happens all the time. Yeah. But then sometimes if I'm looking for a light, say, on the wall, I got my hand on the wall and I'm looking and I don't find it and I don't find it. Mm-hmm. Or I touch something other than the light switch that I didn't expect. It's a hairy paw. Not a hairy paw. Not a hairy paw, but it could just be the edge of a picture frame. It could be a banister. Sure. It could be a coat. Oh, yeah. I have and this if, experience And if all I the time. expect it to be something else, then I freak out. Yeah. You are more sensitive to this kind of thing than I am, but I do relate. Yeah. Big, big scaredy cat is what I am. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it, you it, know, the ghost part is that, you know, it's something comes with. It shouldn't be in a book. It shouldn't be in a bedroom. It shouldn't be, you know, in the bed sheets. It shouldn't be in a tree, right? But right. it is. And it's there because of a reason that has to do with you, but you didn't have a choice about. So this makes me think of a couple things. The first is, have you ever read, uh, St- speaking of Stephen King, have you ever read Stephen King's Dance Macabre? I have. So he I has, don't remember James being in it, but it turns out it is. I think he is, yeah. Um, but King basically has this theory. Now, keep in mind, that book's almost 40 years old at this point. But Jeez. Um, uh, Dance Macabre, he puts forward this theory that's basically like horror stories break down into three kinds of stories. Oh, yeah. This is a nonfiction book, everybody. He was writing about what the what the macabre dance yeah. is like of horror fiction. And it's uh, help me out here if I if I get this wrong. But I, I believe it's the werewolf story, the vampire story and what he basically says is the Frankenstein story, but he calls it the thing that should not be. Yeah. And that's what you're getting at. Right. It's not. It's not a Frankenstein. It's, it's, you know what I mean? It's <laughs> yeah, yeah. the thing that doesn't belong. Now, I would add to that what we circle around a lot on the show and sometimes shows up in M.R. James as well, which would be the cosmic horror story. Yeah, right, the horror out of space. The color out of space. Or, you know? Yeah, just the, the, the horror of your insignificance, right? So there's that. And then what you're hitting on here, the inherent thing about ghost stories, or at least... What you're qualifying here with James is safe places, right? Um, And this is something that is very uh, relevant to today, to the now. Mm. I've been thinking about safe places a lot lately, not just in the sense of like, uh, you know, okay. The joke. So here's an example. Uh, I just walked into the studio on our way here to record today, and there's an office outside the studio. It's some administrator's office, and it has a triangle with the rainbow symbol Mm -hmm. inside of it, and it said, this is a designated safe place. Presumably, that means that uh, students from any... I know the office you're talking about. It means that the person whose office that is has gone through a particular kind of training Yes, and can be expected to act in a certain comforting or neutral way to problems that are sort of on the on the fringe of mainstream regardless of your ethnicity or gender or sexuality Mm -hmm. or what have you right um so there's that way that we think of safe places and that's a designated safe place and then i've been thinking about this lately because i'm as listeners of the podcast know i'm getting more and more paranoid since the trump election of bullying and violence in the streets Uh, And Pizzagate certainly didn't help out with that, right? right? And uh, I've been thinking about this lately. My home is my safe place, right? And so when I'm in my home and I'm doing my work, whether it's writing or preparing for this podcast or sleeping or playing video games, I don't have that anxiety boiling up inside of me of like, you know, something bad might happen. Yeah. Except there's these two houses behind mine that are empty. Uh. And they're right on a strip 
Uh, it's Moreland Avenue, which is a very busy uh, strip here in Atlanta. And uh, there's a lot of homeless people that sort of drift up and down Moreland throughout the day. And, hey, you know what? Like, I don't blame them if they find that these homes don't that's have anybody in them. them man. That's a safe space for them. So they've been camping out in the backyard. They've been lighting fires. Um, just the other day I woke up in the morning and I could smell fire and I looked back and there were a couple dudes huddled around. They had like found some old grill and they just basically started a big bonfire inside the grill so they could keep warm. It's been chilly here in Atlanta lately. And, but this produces a little anxiety in the back of my head about my safe place. Cause yeah, the outside is creeping to the inside. Oh yeah. And, and it's not that I'm thinking oh, one of these guys is going to break into my house, which maybe my neighbors are thinking. I'm thinking, what? it's, it's pretty dry right now. What happens yeah. if that thing tips over and starts a fire in the neighborhood, right? Because someone who owns a house or is familiar with how to maintain a house, they know the things that you shouldn't do to avoid starting a brush, fr- brush fire or to, uh, you know, to weaken the fence in a spot or, or whatever, yeah. right? Yeah. But folks who are just like, trying to find a place to be warm or just trying to get very immediate needs taken care of, they're not going to take the long-term view. Sure, yeah. So it's been in the back of my head lately, like the threatening of a safe space is an inherent identifiable horror that everyone can relate to. So I think you really hit the nail on the head with this. And also the stuff about golf... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the stuff about golf makes me both it, it makes me feel very dismissive but also it makes me say okay I can see the the deeper levels so here. let's clarify yeah, this yeah. so multiple story <laughs> this is a whole academic article that I read that brought this up and I wouldn't have noticed it if it wasn't for the article but multiple MR James stories in this collection and others inc- <laughs> include these academics talking about their prowess at golf or going out and performing, playing golf, uh, and it's weird, right? Or but, referring to golf as a thing that they will end up doing. Yeah, and but it makes sense. Yeah, because what is a golf course, right? It is it is natural landscape turned into uh, a human endeavor. Yeah, it's right? utterly manufactured yeah. without being like raised, without being sort of destroyed. It's not the right. city. It's still natural, quote it's a, unquote. Yeah, a crafted natural space. Mm-hmm. And occasionally something's going to get into it. Yeah, occasionally you're going to have an animal on the grounds or occasionally the ground is going to give way or the sand uh, pit's going to, what is it, sand traps going to sure. get clogged with water or anything. So you have to maintain the quote unquote natural world. Yeah. And it takes an immense amount of resource to keep a golf course going. Like that's one of the reasons why it's a rich person's game, right? Is because yeah. land is expensive, maintenance is expensive, and nature keeps trying to reclaim it. You know? And so the golf course is such a <laughs> it's emblematic of the desire to control the uncontrollable. And exactly. of having to put eternal vigilance to controlling, beating back yeah. nature. And all of M.R. James's ghosts are, in a way, not all. They're not golf ghosts, by a, the way. A lot, yeah, they're not golf ghosts. But a lot of his ghosts are uncivilized, or eruptions, or are animalistic. You know, they yeah. they've got inhuman hair. They make weird noises. They are when they're people. They've been reduced in some way, either by being killed or being starved or being made into an animal who wants to en- enact vengeance in a sort of teeth and claw kind of way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, you know, the wrong kind of thing to have on a golf course. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Well, and, and think about it, too, that this was a period of time where mankind trying to define themselves as civilized against savagery mm-hmm. against their animal instinct was a real important theme to keep in society. nature to keep nature away yeah. and also keep the natural savage away too yeah absolutely and, and that that sort of prejudiced or racist or just simply insensitive term i'm using that on purpose because that's what they were thinking oh yeah certainly and and it 
it's important that it's golf and not some other sport that manufactures a, a lawn into something else, too, because golf was the sport of these academic snobs, right? Yeah. And even to go a little bit up one's own ass about it, golf does not have spectators. Certainly it does now, but golf does not have spectators. It is essentially a walk in the woods. Yeah. It is a a personal activity shared between a few wealthy individuals. It's not you don't sweat performing golf. Performing golf. I don't know. I've, I've <laughs> clearly not played enough golf that I call it performing golf. But yeah. Um, Swing and a miss, Chris. It is. Swing and a miss. Really fascinating, the the whole golf thing. I would not have noticed it. But there's another thing that comes up for me that wasn't really in the literature here. And I mentioned this earlier, just that like there's something comforting about James's prose. Yeah, it's lovely. And he describes with lovely detail the countryside or... Mm, the homes, the buildings, maybe they're buildings that are falling apart, castles, the, books. The comfiness of beds. Yeah. Oh, man. This is a, this is the kind of stuff that makes me, like, long for, like, a, a lovely bed and breakfast <laughs> uh, where you've got a cozy bed with a down pillow and you wake up in the morning to, uh, you know, fried eggs, you know, like you can, you can smell the food mm -hmm. in these stories. It's, it's, it's one, he's one of those writers that makes me hungry. Uh, and he just does this lovely job of producing the landscape and the setting in a way that really, really brings it to life. So that then, so then it's really creepy. The ghost invading it's horrifying it, yeah. when it's taken away. Right, it's actually invading the safety. He creates sa what we call safe places today yeah. within his prose, and then he dismantles that. It's pretty awesome, and and I don't know, I don't get the sense if he even knew the the expertise that he was wielding when he was putting these stories together. But it, it, he's, he was certainly operating at the top of the game, uh, but he was also just doing all this provost stuff, you know, and, and just thought of this as, oh, I'll work throughout the year on my next, uh, my next jolly horror story that I'll tell the lads around the, the candle. <laughs> so, okay, we've certainly, uh, we've appreciated it deeply, yeah. right? Yeah. But why are they still around? Why are these ghost stories still around? Why are they... Uh, you you have a note in here. Uh, it's pretty popular, and new editions are being published each year. Yeah, so, you know, a thing we usually do on Super Context is try to look at, well, how many copies is this sold, or has it won awards? Well, it's 112 years old. Uh, who knows? Yeah, and we usually discover that nobody wants to tell you how much they've sold of anything. Especially with books. But... Uh, in this case, I think we could say it's fairly successful in that they're constantly publishing new editions of it. This is IP, just like always. It's being uh, created and uh, recreated and recapitulated constantly as television, as, yeah. as inspiration for other people's stories, as graphic novels. Well, yeah. So the latest version, as far as I can tell, and the one that popped up on my radar for comic book reasons is uh, there is a new adaptation of his short stories that is by Leah Moore and John Repian. Uh, for our listeners out there who know our penchant for Alan Moore, Leah Moore is his daughter, and John Repian is her husband. Uh, and they basically adapted for the stories from Ghost Stories of an Antiquary into graphic novel format. Uh, I haven't had a chance to look at this yet, I'm looking forward to it. Mm. Maybe, maybe that's what I'll do on Christmas Eve this year. We'll oh, see. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Um, but uh, you should also read a ghost story to your dogs. Well, I was going to read it to your daughter, but you keep telling me that I'm not allowed within a hundred feet of the house without me knowing. Yeah, look, if I ever catch <laughs> you reading a ghost story to my daughter and I and uh, I haven't like sanctioned it, yeah, I'm going to kill you. What if I read it to her from inside the crawl space, but I don't open the door? Let's take a break. <laughs> Today's episode of Super Context is also brought to you by Super Context, the podcast autopsy of media. Yeah, so we like to take a break sometimes in the middle of episodes and talk about what we're consuming right now. And hey, 
This is our Christmas episode. So what's your favorite Christmas media? I understand that this is now hipster bullshit and that everybody likes to joke about it and that it's not interesting to say anymore. Oh. But my favorite Christmas movie is Die Hard. Oh, that's an interesting one. I just got my wife to watch Die Hard for the first time last year. Oh, God, I wish I'd been there. Yeah, she was unfamiliar with a lot of the 80s action cinema, so I made her go back and watch that, Lethal Weapon, and we still have yet to watch Another a Steven Christmas movie. Seagal. Uh, I don't think, does Steven Seagal have a Christmas one? But uh, she doesn't She doesn't know her, her history of uh, horrible slash awesome 80s action movies. I'm glad you pulled out of that horrible spiral that you're in. But yeah, I love Die Hard, and it's it, I truly love Die Hard for Christmas. What's yours? Well, my wife and I have a tradition of watching Christmas-oriented horror movies on Christmas. <laughs> Our favorite one is Rare Exports. Have you ever seen this before? Why have I heard of that? Uh, you probably have told me about beautiful. it. It's beautiful. It's this wonderful movie uh, that's set in Europe. I th- I want to say it's Norwegian. Uh, and it's, it's all about, you know, what if Santa Claus was real and maybe evil. <laughs> Uh, and then the other one, Sold. I'm watching it. The other one that we watched last year, we actually saw in the theater because it was a new movie. Uh, did you hear about the the Krampus movie that came out last I did. year? I'm not really hip to this Krampus thing. Uh, you should be hip to Krampus, but not to, that was eh, it was OK. OK. It wasn't that great of a movie, but Krampus is great, man. And I have to recommend there is a wonderful book by the writer artist Brom called just Krampus that is. In the Stephen King tradition, great story about the Krampus mythos. I really like it. Okay, maybe this can be our, our Christmas episode 2017. Ooh, yeah, that would be great. I love that book, and I own it. Uh, and you know what else I like? We brought it up this episode. Christmas tradition for us is watching Doctor Who. There's always a new Doctor Who episode around Christmas, so I enjoy catching up with that. And I think that somehow comes out of the tradition of that BBC thing where they had a ghost story for Christmas, which came out of adapting M.R. James stories into television. And you're closing the circle. Yeah. Hey, if you like what we do here at Super Context, please subscribe. Um, that is very helpful to us. And even more helpful is if you write a review and rate us. And thank you, as always, to everyone who's reviewed us. Um, it really warms the cockles of my little black heart when you say that we're doing a good job here, especially when you tell us we're doing a good job and then say something you wish was better, because then I know you mean it. Yeah, there's been some wonderful stuff lately, so thank you very much, and maybe we'll start making it a habit of reading some of those reviews, because they've been illuminating for us as well, I think. You mean reading them out loud to the listeners? Yeah. Isn't that a little self-serving? So we're back. Uh, Charlie has made it clear off air, you know, when and and where I'm allowed to read horror stories to his children. And you can have this finger back after the show. Fine. Fine. Is it a hairy finger? (laughs) The reason I'm asking is because it turns out that these M.R. James stories, like uh, Lovecraft and some of these other horror guys, he was a little hinky about sexuality. (laughs) Um, Well, he was a Victorian. He was very much. That makes sense. I don't really. Although, I mean, clearly the Victorians had sex, too. I mean, they had children. Yeah. I don't think that the, sometimes I wonder if short Victorian as shorthand for, you know, totally repressed and completely fucked up about things. If maybe. Oh, I don't know. Maybe that's a bit reductive. Oh, yeah. I mean, I suspect that if. Right, that that's a uh, hmm, stereotype that's evolved over time within our fictions. There's a, uh, This is a diversion, but there's this comic book that I just became aware of this week uh, called Insects, and it's spelled S-E-X-T-S. Okay. And the premise is it's about uh, two women during the Victorian era who are lesbian lovers uh, and... They're also, well, they're, they're trying to hide it, but they're also insect fairy monsters. Okay. And it's this bizarre story that's like uh, erotica because there's like pretty flagrant like 
pornish scenes between the two women. Huh. Then it's also a story about these strong female characters in the Victorian age trying to get by. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they turn into these monsters and just rip men to shreds. And it <laughs> okay. is fascinating to me. Um, and it. So is this what Under the Skin was based on? <laughs> no, no, no. This is relatively recent. It just okay. came out this year. Um, but it's. Yeah, it really brings to mind what you're talking about here, this idea that Victorianism is is prudish. And M.R. James seems prudish, right? But then we get a classic example here. This is the only, we're, you know, we're not going to go into these stories and microanalyze them. That's for your English class. That's for your thesis paper. Um, but here's a quote from Casting the Runes. He put his hand into the well-known nook under the pillow. Only it did not get so far. What he touched was, according to his account, a mouth with teeth and with hair about it. And he declares, not the mouth of a human being. <laughs> so uh, the article that I, I got this from, uh, the, I believe the guy's name is Daryl Jones, who's, who's analyzing this text. He's like, okay, that's clearly about sex. Uh, that's <laughs> Do you believe that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's... Whether or not James is conscious of it or not, he's that's vagina dentata at its classic, right? Okay, let me let me throw a bomb into this. Oh, okay. There is no horror and there is no body discomfort without the knowledge of sex is both good and violent. That sex is fun and can destroy a body, either through death or through pregnancy. Okay. That sex is a desire that we have to contain. All of these things. I mean, imagine Alien, right? In the 70s, in the early 70s, no one was trying to figure out why they, you know, why sex was so repressed, you know? Like, yeah. they put those, the vaginal imagery, the sort of muscle imagery, the sexual imagery, and it just made alien and i'm referring to the ridley scott 1970 you know science fiction horror film alien that sexual charge that alien had which is in a lot of ways the same as the sexual charge that the mr james story has mm -hmm. that's because sex is in stuff it's there you know well right and it's part of the human experience no matter how repressed you are yeah but you know People pull Lovecraft apart left and right for his uh, subconscious sexual imagery and his fear of fish, you know, uh, for the same reasons. I don't think it's that unreasonable, especially... I'm not saying that it's not sexual. Yeah. I'm just saying that it's... I, I guess I'm jumping ahead. There, you know, there's a lot of what this guy who... What was the name of the dude who wrote that? Um, uh, Daryl Jones, I believe. Daryl Jones then says, oh, you know, uh, that M.R. James was a prude and he was scared of the nether regions and all that. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that maybe it's less about, oh, that's a vagina. That's vag uh, vagina dentata, right? Yeah. The, the vagina with teeth. Yeah. And he is a fainting Victorian who's scared of that. And more like, you know what's fucking scary? Sex is scary and bodies are scary just as much as they're fun and cool. That's kind of why they're scary. Yeah. And I yeah, think everybody certainly. knows that, especially when you start to decay. Well, I would argue there. Uh, so we, I don't want to get into this. You brought it up before we recorded. But apparently, you know, as a bachelor for his whole life, there was some speculation that Mr. James may not have been. Uh, you know, traditionally heterosexual. Who, who knows what went on with his life, right? But the Let idea... Out, I didn't bring that up because I thought You it, just told I me read, it was I mean, a thing. People yeah. have written, you know, the assumed gay writer M.R. James. Yeah. But the idea of... You're in the middle of the night, you're you're sort of half asleep. <laughs> you push your hand up through your pillow, and there's a mouth, there? and you stick it into a vagina with teeth. That's horrifying. Whether or not you have a problem with sex or not, yeah. So whether or not, or not, or not. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't. I, I, all of this is to say the reason I brought this into the conversation yeah. is because women are pretty much 
entirely absent from that these is stories. True. That is true. Uh, representation, not Mr. James's strong suit. But you know what? It's 112 years ago. I, I'm going to give him a pass. It was the late 1800s. They had to wear suits made of wool. They were suffering. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll <laughs> leave it at that. Which leads us to my central question about this episode and and about Mr. James, which is that's right. Christmas Eve. So the reason that you are listening to this for Christmas season, the reason that we're talking about these stories, they were a Christmas tradition. Yeah. And it wasn't a wild thing that M.R. James made up that we're going to do ghost stories for Christmas. Ghost stories for Christmas is a real thing. Yeah. So ghost stories were traditionally told in oral form as he was doing it. I mean, there wasn't, I, I mean, I, yes, there were publishers and printing back then, but I don't think a lot but of people But people didn't were go and buying, buy a new book of ghost stories They weren't buying every, pulp paperbacks, yeah. 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 Um, but, wait, publishers needed a mass of content, and ghost stories fit the bill. They were short enough and cheap enough and generic enough, and they could be cut easily to fit the length of a small book smallish book mm-hmm. so there's that mr james is really kind of on the cusp of right before the pulp publishing movement i think yeah because in my mind like these days one can say uh we're gonna buy a new christmas book every year yeah you know, and and fill up our shelf right but that's like that's a real that's decadence i think at the end of the 1800s right like the, I suppose, the idea of yeah. a new book all the time. Mm. And the Pulp Fiction boom then means that people can walk around with cheap paper. Yeah. Right? But uh, mostly stuff was was publicly published, right? Like serialized or, right. or published in an edition that could survive in a library. Right? Yeah. And when we're saying this book is 112 years old, that's when the collection was published. Yeah. Like some of these stories were written in the late 1800s, I'm yeah, pretty yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. And he just added them to the collection in 1904. Um, so, okay, my question, why ghost stories on Christmas Eve and how can I get into that? Well, <laughs> a lot of you out there are probably going, well, duh, Charles Dickens. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, A Christmas Carol came out in 1843. This was also, coincidentally, the first year the commercially produced Christmas cards were sent out. Um, And this is interesting. I didn't realize this, but Dickens' story was a reflection of this growing trend of Christmas becoming secular, moving away from Christianity. Yeah. And the ghost story for Christmas was something that he took as a given. He was he didn't invent the ghost story for Christmas. Right. He wrote a ghost story for Christmas that is now incredibly famous and sort of perpetuated a more um uh I want to say commodified again but that's not quite right. A more traditional and a more um blanket kind of understanding of ghost stories for Christmas. And there's a couple threads here as to why ghost stories were popular at the time and why Christmas was the time to tell them. Uh, The first that I found here in an article was apparently because of all the economic changes going on. Now, we think of this today as Downton Abbey or (laughs) upstairs, downstairs, right? But the idea of that you had servants downstairs and that homes had... They were designed in such a way so that your servants were barely seen. Houses right? were alive with activity, even if you were the only, quote unquote, person who lived there. Yeah. And, and this is a quote from the paper that I pulled this from. It said, you would actually have people popping in and out without you really even knowing they were there, which could be quite a freaky experience. You've got these ghostly figures who actually inhabit your house. So there's that. There's... The Downton Abbey aspect where you've got, uh, I don't know what their names are, Mr. Bates uh, flowing in, in and out. No, have you never watched Downton Abbey? I mean, I watched a couple episodes. Oh, Mr. Bates. There's some guy with a limp. Yeah, that's Mr. And Bates. And everybody dies. I, do they? Don't he, they? They're ghosts. It turns out they're all ghosts. <laughs> they were dead the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> Only Bruce Willis can see Downton Abbey. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it was so popular. The only person watching Downton Abbey all these years has been Bruce Willis. So gaslight 
brings flickering bad light to previously dark places, yeah. which then makes stuff creepy. There's that as People well. People are taking photographs, you know, for the first time ever with stuff that catches ghost images just because the technology's all fucked up. Yeah, so we lead to spirit photography. Yeah. As people secularize a little bit, right, then they also start thinking about, uh, well, wait, if, if I'm less concerned with heaven, what happens after we die? Yep. Yeah. So there's all this stuff that's like bringing up anxiety. Oh, and don't forget my favorite part. The safe places. Yeah, my favorite part is radio. Yes. The wireless. So you've got these noises static. and you don't know where they're coming from. Maybe we hear Great Aunt Edna in the static. Exactly. Um so what does Christmas Carol have to do with all of this? Well this is I didn't know this. Maybe if I had stuck with my English major instead of transitioning over to communications, I would have known this. But apparently Christmas at the time was in danger of being wiped out because of puritanical zeal. So the idea was that I have Christmas a contemporary was... story for this. Okay. So I just saw an article recently about a guy who uh, is a evangelical preacher and he got thrown out of a mall because he went to the line for the mall Santa photos yeah. where a bunch of parents had their kids waiting to get on Santa's lap and had the picture taken. Yeah. And he started screaming at the whole line that Santa wasn't real. Oh, good. Kids, Santa's not real. Jesus is real. Uh-huh. Your parents are defiling what Christmas really means. So he sounds like a healthy individual. I mean, he's whatever he is, right? But this is exactly the same kind yeah, of stuff it, it, that was and going it, it, on. It gave me a way to understand completely, like, oh, yeah, so if you were getting real, real deep in the in the Jesus part of yeah. the religion, and Christmas was about Jesus, and you were starting to see people just enjoy the pretty lights, you know, or having, you know, it, it, certainly Coca-Cola had not yet invented Santa, but there was still, you know, a move towards uh, community yeah. and happiness and buying stuff and not living on a farm and going to church. Sure, yeah. And so Dickens comes along and he writes this story and it and it brings the holiday from the brink of extinction back into this secularized kind of commercial way. And reestablishes some of the sort of the Christian ideals that Ex- are also part of the of of uh, I don't even know what I'm talking about anymore. Help me out here. No, I mean you're right. Is it's it has themes that are inherently Christian, but not overtly Christian, right? Um, so the ideas of uh, you know giving and being with family and uh, uh, celebrating what what you have in the world, the, all of this, the, the the main themes of the end of a Christmas Carol, loving your neighbor. The, yeah, exactly. Um, but. There was a practice well before Mr. Dickens came along and of... Here, here we are in my favorite high school, man, you don't know the real deal <laughs> kind of conversation. This is it, man. It's all pagan, man. Saturnalia, man. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus wasn't born on Christmas Day, man. They took over the pagan festival with their Jesus to make sure that you didn't think that the earth was important, man. Exactly. There were there had, was a long tradition. I actually of, believe that, everybody. I, I'm using a funny voice, but I do think that Easter and, and Christmas are chosen to match up with previously pagan holidays to to have a synergistic connection to the community and to keep people from feeling like Christianity was knocking away their long traditions. Well, yeah, it's in here in the text, but think about it. It also just lines up with our experience with seasons changing and with life being, if life was still based around an agrarian lifestyle, yeah. of course they would make sense. And if you're going to have this this horrible death of your of your religious figure, of your savior, right? Then you do it at the time when the harvest is about to begin, when mm-hmm. there's life coming back. And then if you're going to try and make up for the fact that the days are short and it's cold and people are dying, you say, this is when the Savior was born. Mm-hmm. And, and then you back it up. you tell ghost stories about why all those people are dying and how they're coming back. <laughs> <laughs> you tell ghost stories also to sort of uh, to, to make a part of the human experience the natural effect right. of... of darkness and fallowness beginning to disappear. And to your point, uh, apparently Christmas 25th of December was selected 
because it was connected to pagan festivals like Yule and Sol Invictus, which is the birthday of the unconquered sun. I like the name of that. That's and, like a metal album. And the name of the New Faith No More record. <laughs> is that what it is? That's what they call uh, it, Sol Invictus. And did, now, oh, yeah, that's right. And now, I didn't know that until now, and now I hate them even more. Oh, uh, you... What do you... I adore Faith No More? Oh, okay, but you don't really care the about the new Faith yeah, yeah. No More. Yeah. I, I'm with you. High five. High five. Okay, uh, <laughs> dude, bro, dude. <laughs> <laughs> this is terrible. Anyways, all it's of this Christmas. Come on, means, be happy. Yeah, all this means there's a long-standing tradition before the Victorians of human beings celebrating. Ghost stories yeah. in the winter. Rebirth and, and the continuation of life and, and the sort of eruptions of things. Like Saturn, Saturn's all about reversals, man. You know, the god Saturn is about the reversal. When people talk about the Saturn return with astrology, <laughs> the Saturn return, which happens roughly 30, 40 years after you're born. Are you going to tell right? me Mercury is in retrograde? I don't even know what that means. I, <laughs> but this this Saturn thing, that's when you're supposed to start thinking about your parents and, and what your life is. Mm -hmm. And it comes for your midlife crisis. It's like built in, you know? Anyway. Yeah. But I mean, that's the thing is that it really seems to me that like the tradition was, and we, we seem to have lost it over the years. And you know what? This year, I'm going to bring it back, at least in my house. Maybe you out there listening, maybe you'll have an opportunity to as well. Charlie's probably not going to do so because his wife's not going to really like that too much. Hey, we had hot chocolate and cookies and we read the book Little Santa. Oh, is that a ghost story? No, it's a story about how the Claus family decided to leave the North Pole, but Santa liked it up there, so he stayed and met a bunch of elves. Uh, and I think now they you wanted, know I think the they wanted rest to leave. of the story. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know that I was here with Harvey. We have a tradition uh, with, our, with our kids, um, and we have th these very sort of uh, cozy, comforting, seasonal things. The hot chocolate, the cookies, the reading the Christmas story, Twas the Night Before Christmas, the Polar Express, the Grinch, who's, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And we make a a family event that is um, not generative, but uh, it, it builds upon itself, right? You know, we have this collection of books that we bought fresh for each Christmas. Okay. And that we read to each other. Well... Uncle Jack and Uncle Ted and I are going to have to have a conversation <laughs> this year. Chris is referring to my, uh, as of yet, unmarried and childless uh, brothers. Yeah, who are both big fans of horror and uh, <laughs> will support me in my endeavor to try to sneak the ghost story into your Christmas Eve tradition. What about sneaking the ghost story in really makes you happy? What's the thing? Because, like, okay, yeah. if we can say ghosts... And the idea of spirits, I mean, the Holy Spirit, rebirth, the harvest, paganism, the you know control of the natural world, like all these things combine mm. and make Christmas more of a of a of a rich experience. Cool. I'm totally with that. But now let's talk about right now and you. So personally. for me personally, what does that do? I for mean, you, you know. I'll have I'll take any excuse to read a horror story or watch a horror movie to right? get a little bit uh no like just kind of no um I really truly believe that horror stories are one of the best ways for culture to reflect back on itself um that we experience the world through that sort of terrifying proposition of what would happen if it's taken away Oh, uh -huh. um, well, that's very nice, and, actually. And so I think a good horror story on Christmas Eve helps, maybe helps us appreciate the things that we have, but also serves as a cautionary tale as we begin to start the year over again. But maybe it's just that I like watching and reading horror stories, man. But I, I like the idea of the tradition. Do you like the, the warm fire, hot chocolate Christmas yeah, stuff, too? Do you I'm like good Christmas with, carols? No. I mean, not. I don't hate them. I'm not like the Grinch or anything. But that's but not your thing. No, it's not my thing. Here's, here's, the, here's the thing is that I grew up in a household that was dysfunctional, and my Christmases were dysfunctional, and so I don't have fond memories of them. And so I'm trying to recreate something for my family uh, and traditions that are brand new uh, to replace those memories. 
And this seems like a perfect way to do that. Now, some people may say, well, you know, that's not pleasant. Christmas is supposed to be pleasant. That's that, that's fairly unpleasant. Uh, people who would rather have the reminder of the good stuff. Yeah. Like, I want to yeah. be, and I feel this a little bit, I want to be with my family. I want my children to feel comfortable. I want them to feel safe at home. I don't want them to think that there's fucking ghosts in the basement, right? Yeah. Uh, there are. <laughs> Your basement. Only because mama and daddy have been fighting. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 yeah, you're right. People don't want discomfort around yeah. the Although, let's be honest, all of us who are celebrating our holidays, there's no way some discomfort. discomfort. Yeah, because life is discomfort. It, well, especially when you try to bring family into the equation and and pretend <laughs> that everything's perfect, right? But that's another episode for another time. A uh, good friend of mine refers to this time of year as the great inconvenience. Yeah, I can go with that. But the point of a ghost story is what? Is to be slightly creeped out just enough to still be able to enjoy your life. And once that petrifying part is over, it's laid to rest, right? It's not uh, hovering around in the back of your mind. It shouldn't be, right? The stories are usually written in such a way that the ghost has been quelled or something like that, right? Um, Virginia Woolf, of all people, apparently wrote about this. Uh, she and, wrote about everything. She had an essay called The Supernatural in Fiction, and she said, It is pleasant to be afraid when we are conscious that we are in no kind of danger. Uh, when are we When are we ever conscious of being in no kind of danger? When we're in our safe place. In Christmas. Yeah. Huh. So Christmas is the perfect... We're bringing this all the way around again to the whole... Uh, this is a, a distinguished safe place. Uh, Christmas is supposed to be that, right? Uh, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's dysfunctional. But hey, you know what? If you have that, and it is, maybe the ghost story is the perfect time then. Then it's pleasant to be afraid because then you can turn around and look and say, Oh, so it's the most comforting time of the year? So you can read about vaginas with teeth? Only if they're under your pillow. You've been listening to Super Context, a podcast autopsy of media. And how it informs our everyday culture. Our theme music is Human Factor by Mile Marker. And you're listening to Drive Fast by Three Chain Links. Show notes are available at supercontextpodcast.tumblr.com. And you can email the show at supercontextpodcast at gmail.com. We'd like to hear what you have to say. I'm available on Twitter as Christian Sager. And I'm there at Bennett Radio. Two N's, two T's. 